Okay, so now on to the energy harvesting. So we've seen how the energy is actually absorbed, the photons are actually absorbed, but now how do we get it onto these uh, compounds of ATP and NADPH? The story there begins with photosystem one. So what happens here in photosystem one is similar to photosystem two. It's gonna be an electron transport chain, but the fate of the electrons is very, very different. Now here's where we are. This is the picture that we saw before. Here's photosystem two and all the electrons going down to photosystem one. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this slide and move it this way to the right, okay? And so that we can see what happens then to the right over here. There it is. So as we saw before, photon comes in here and it oxidizes P700 and two electrons now start participating in an electron transport chain. Here's the difference though. This electron transport chain is very, very short. So even though these two electrons are gonna participate in a series of reactions in which they lose energy, they don't lose much energy. So this, this very short electron transport chain has these electrons go from photosystem one onto another molecule called ferrodoxin, which then transform, or, uh, transports this, these electrons to another complex that's called NADP reductase. And you can probably guess what it does. It's gonna reduce NADP. Now to reduce NADP, remember what we have to do. We either are going to uh, take off an oxygen or add a hydrogen. And in this case, we're gonna add a hydrogen and make NADP into NADPH. All right, so here's what happens. Photons come in, they uh, oxidize P700, the two electrons then get transferred to ferrodoxin, which then uh, transfers it to NADP reductase, so it reduces NADP reductase, and then the electrons end up here on NADP reductase at a high energy state. So this is the difference. It's not a low state this time, it's high. And so what we can do is have an enzyme come along in here and take these two electrons and we don't have to dump them off onto oxygen like we do in the mitochondria or onto another photosystem like we do in, in photosystem two. Here we can put them onto an organic compound that will hold them in a high energy state. And that organic compound, as you might have guessed, is NADP. So here's then the reaction. We take an NADP plus two protons plus two electrons. And then we add those two electrons to NADP. The first electron eliminates that positive charge here. The second electron combines with this hydrogen to make NADPH and the other proton is left on its own. So this is how we're making NADPH. Literally the, the, the uh, energy from the photon goes directly to NADPH. So that's our first compound that we're making to harvest this energy in the light dependent reactions. And the other compound was ATP. Now ATP is made in a way that you've already seen. It's made in a way that's almost identical to what we saw in the mitochondrion. Here, if you remember, if you uh, uh, look at this thylakoid membrane, here's P680, here's P700. So this is photosystem two here. This is photosystem one. Now photons come in here, and what they're going to do then is oxidize P680. The electrons move down their electron transport chain and then end up on P700 after it gets oxidized. Those electrons then eventually end up in NADPH. But now, how do we make the ATP? Well, look here. What we have here is an ATP synthase, just like we had in the, in the, the mitochondrion. So the thylakoid has ATP synthase on it. So what we're going to do now is use the energy from this photon to pump hydrogens across this membrane, okay, in a very similar manner to what we did in the, uh, in the mitochondria. But now there's a difference. See if you can notice it. What's going to happen then is that we use this energy to pump two hydrogens using active transport against the concentration gradient across the thylakoid membrane. Okay, now notice we're pumping now from the outside of the thylakoid to the inside. This is different than what we saw in the mitochondria. Mitochondria, we're pumping it out. So this is not a mistake. This is correct. This is how nature actually functions. So now I've had two hydrogens get pumped across, one for each electron on average. And the question then becomes this, how many ATP can I make from that? Well, you know that one too. That's going to be just like what we saw in the, mito in the mitochondria. These hydrogens are going to diffuse through this ion channel because now there's a concentration gradient for them across the thylakoid. And as they diffuse through, they're going to uh, transduce that energy. The energy is going to be transduced from the motion of the, of the ions through the channel and then into ATP as we saw before. So electrons now go down their concentration gradient, go through the ATP synthase, and the ATP synthase does its thing and makes ATP. So here's what we do. We have light coming in, hitting photosystem photo 2. Photosystem 2 then becomes an active transport system, or that electron transport chain becomes an active transport system to pump hydrogen across the thylakoid. That hydrogen gradient then generates ATP, 
and photosystem 1 then generates NADPH. So that's the process that we have here in this uh, 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 light dependent reactions. So from these photons, we get one ATP and one NADPH per essentially pair of electrons. Now it, that's a little bit misleading. It's really not quite that simple. Remember, we have to have other electrons come in here and, and uh, break apart the, the uh, water through what's called photolysis or photolysis, if you will. And we also then have to have some inefficiencies that occur and so on. So it's not quite this perfect, but it's awfully close. It, it's plenty of energy enough anyway to make these molecules. All right, so here's where we are now. We have the light dependent reactions understood. It's how the energy from the photons is absorbed and then transduced onto ATP and NADPH. Now what we have to do is take that energy in the, in the form of ATP and NADPH and use that to drive these light independent reactions to produce the sucrose or whatever the photosynthate happens to be. And then we're done. That's it. So that's all we have to, have to do to understand what's going on. So let's take a look at this. Now here's the beauty of it. The light independent reactions are very much like the Krebs cycle and glycolysis run backwards. It's not identical. I mean, it's not going to be exactly the same as that. But there's a lot of similar compounds, and certainly the concepts are essentially the same. For example, there's a cycle. Just like we saw with the Krebs cycle, there's another cycle here that's called the Calvin-Benson cycle, or the carbon fixation cycle, if you wish. So once you actually go through the carbon fixation cycle, then you're going to produce a molecule primarily of glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate. And that's what you're then going to use to make this photosynthate. All right, so let's take a look at that. We start with a molecule we haven't seen before, but it's similar to molecules that we have seen. It's called ribulose bisphosphate, and it's abbreviated RUBP. Ribulose bisphosphate is what you expect. It's a sugar, ribulose, and it's got two phosphate groups on it, and it's very much like ribose. It's not identical, but it's similar. It's a five carbon sugar like ribose is, and this is where the carbon fixation step is going to actually occur. The Calvin-Benson cycle starts here. What we're going to do with this ribulose bisphosphate is we are going to add a carbon to it and transform it from a five carbon sugar to a six carbon compound. And the carbon that we're going to add to it is inorganic carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. So here is synthesis. Remember synthesis, the, by definition, is taking inorganic carbon and making it into organic carbon. And so this is exactly what we're going to do. So the CO2 comes from the atmosphere, so the plant absorbs that CO2 from the atmosphere, and then it makes this six carbon compound, the identity of which I'm not going to worry about at this point. There is an enzyme that controls that, and that enzyme is called Rubisco. And notice this enzyme does not end in ACE, and that's because this is an abbreviation of the total name of this thing. The name of this enzyme is called ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase and oxidase. That's literally the name of this thing. So nobody likes to call it that, so we just call it Rubisco. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most abundant enzyme on the planet. Every plant, every photosynthetic organism has Rubisco in it, tons of Rubisco in it. So this is the reason why you exist, is because of this enzyme. It takes inorganic carbon and makes inorganic carbon so that you then can put it into your body. Now what we have to do is take this and make it into this photosynthate. So the six carbon compound then goes through a series of reactions that are endergonic primarily and it makes glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Right? So because these are endergonic however we need an energy source to drive it. So remember the whole point of the uh, light dependent reactions was to generate ATP and NADPH to drive this cycle, to drive this, this uh, light uh, independent reactions. So here's where it comes in. For each one of these G3Ps, I need one ATP, and so the ATP uh, will hydrolyze into ADP and leave the phosphate group onto the, the intermediate that's leading to G3P. But I also need to oxidize an NADPH to make an ADP and to get the G3P. So this is the basic beginning of this cycle, about halfway through. And the G3P is what's important. Okay, now, before we see exactly why the G3P is so important, I am going to introduce a new concept here, and that is the stoichiometry of this cycle. Stoichiometry, when we study stoichiometry, we're looking at ratios of, of elements or compounds and things like this. And in this particular case, the stoichiometry is something we have to pay attention to because the stoichiometry of the Krebs cycle was easy. It was one to one to one to one to one. It always went 
one molecule to another molecule. Oxaloacetate became citrate, became isocitrate, became alpha ketoglutarate eventually, and so on. So it goes around each one is one to one. This cycle isn't like that. This cycle goes five, uh, sorry, three to five to three. So it's a little different. This really shouldn't start with one ribulose bisphosphate. It should really start with three. And then we'll see exactly why that, that works out that way. All right, so here we have one ribulose bisphosphate. We're going to do the same thing to two others. Now, what I'm going to put up on the slide is going to look ugly. And it's going to look really nasty, but it's all exactly the same. There it is. Okay, so notice this is exactly the same thing just three times. And so what we've done is this. We've taken now three ribulose bisphosphates, count the total number of carbons that we have on these three ribulose bisphosphates. It's 5 times 3, or 15. Now, look at the G3Ps that we've created here. And we count up the total number of, of carbons on those six G3Ps. Well, it's 6 times 3. That's 18. So we started with 15 carbons. And now we have 18 carbons. And the reason we have the 18 carbons is because we've added these three carbon dioxides. All right? Now, I'm going to do something which I've shown you before. I'm going to think about this in a way that is fictitious. It's wrong in its details. However, it's logically correct. We've seen this before. This is how scientists do, the, do uh, solve really difficult problems a lot of times. You see the problem in a different way, which isn't strictly accurate, but the logic is identical. Right? So here's the thought. Imagine these. 15 carbons, these 5, 10, 15 carbons, are on these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 G3Ps. All right, so if we count those up, that's still 15 carbons. So these original 15 carbons are just on these 5 G3Ps. The three new carbons coming from these three carbon dioxides, I'm going to imagine, ended up on this G3P because that represents the new three carbon compound. Okay, now I realize it's, these carbons are not actually on this exact G3P. But if we look at it this way, it's logically identical, and we can see that this three G3P is special. It's new. And that's what I'm going to call the golden G3P. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the most important step in all life on Earth, creating G3P. When people talk about photosynthesis creating sugar, it's not the most efficient or, or insightful way of looking at it. What photosynthesis is really producing is this G3P. From this G3P, we can make everything. Every compound in your body came from G3P, every single one. So if we look at this, we can then see the cycle as generating this special G3P, which I'll call the golden G3P. And these other ones are just the original 15 carbons that we started with. OK, now what I'm going to do now is this. I'm going to complete the cycle by taking these 15 carbons on the 5 G3P, which are not golden, and recombining them into ribulose bisphosphates. I'm going to take this G3P, put it into a pool of golden G3P, and use that to make the photosynthate. All right, so here what we're going to do now is move this slide over one, exactly one, and we'll look here at the G3P. Here we are. Okay, so here we have the golden G3P that we've made, and here we have the 15 carbons on the five non-golden G3P. Now here's what I'm going to do. Take these five G3Ps, and I'm going to recombine them into three ribulose bisphosphates, just like we started with. Okay? Now, these reactions, taking these 5G3P and making ribulose bisphosphates, does not add or subtract any carbons. There's 15 carbons here. There's 15 carbons here. However, these reactions are endergonic. Therefore, there has to be an energy source. Again, I'm going to use the energy that I generated in the light-dependent reactions. In this case, only ATP. To make the ribulose bisphosphates is going to cost me three ATPs, one for each ribulose bisphosphate. So here we go. Then I add the, the, the three ATPs. I get the ribulose bisphosphate, and the cycle is complete. And the only new thing that I've generated is this G3P, which I then will collect into a pool of golden G3P. All right? So we'll see what to do with the, with the golden G3P here in just a moment. But the point, again, is this photosynthesis is producing G3P. All right, now, here is a summary equation. All the stuff that we have here, the ribulose bisphosphates, are all essentially catalysts. Because the ribulose bisphosphate starts, gets completely destroyed, but then it goes back to ribulose bisphosphate. So everything in, in the intermediates in this cycle 
are simply catalysts, including these non-golden G3Ps. But here's what has to change. Here's the new stuff. I have to start with three carbon dioxides in order to make this golden G3P. I have to have three carbons. I have to have nine ATP. Now remember nine because there's one, two, three that I have to use here in this part of the cycle, but I also have to use six over here. One of these for each of the G3Ps. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so there's the nine. But also I have six NADPH. Okay, so those also get added into the equations. And the six NADPH then, uh, then end up being all oxidized into NAD. And I need a water molecule, which I haven't shown the details of. But all of that will produce one G3P, and then the ATP all get made into ADP, and then the uh, NADPH all get oxidized into NADP. All right, and that's it. So this is the summary equation, really, of the light independent reactions. We're making G3P from three carbon dioxides, and we need this energy to do it, plus a water molecule. And that'll do it. That actually gives us the G3P. So then what? What do we do with the G3P? Well, this is what you make all organic compounds out of. The plant will make everything out of it uh, that it needs out of it, and you will then absorb that stuff that the plant makes, and you'll use it to make anything that you want. Or sometimes it'll go through like a cow or a, or a pig or something like that, but if you eat meat, ultimately all of these compounds that you're eating, that you're ingesting, were created by plants and rearranged into the compounds in the different organisms that you ingest. So what does the G3P do? Well, the golden G3P, remember, we've seen G3P before. It's one of the intermediates. In fact, it's the highest energy intermediate in glycolysis. So here's what we can do. We can run glycolysis, but backwards. Now, if you remember, the oxidation steps, sorry, not the oxidation steps, the destabilization steps of glycolysis start with glucose and then work their way up to G3P. If you go back to those uh, slides, you'll see the delta G of those reactions is positive 15 kilocalories per mole. So we had to add energy. Where did that energy come from? Where did the 15 kilocalories come from? I'm not going to answer that. You can answer that. You should answer that because that, that could show up on the exam. But the point is I'm lifting energy into the glucose and lifting up that, the carbons and the glucose the energy states up to G3P. So G3P is one of the highest energy compounds we can have. What we're now going to do is run that series of glycolytic, glycolytic steps for the destabilization reactions backwards, which means the delta G is negative. It's negative 15 kilocalories per mole, which means it can happen spontaneously. I don't need any extra energy to do this. The energy I need is all in the G3P. And so what I do is this. I run it back all the way to glucose. But I can also run it back to fructose 6-phosphate and stop. And if I do that, then I end up with a molecule of glucose and a molecule of fructose 6-phosphate. Now the fructose 6-phosphate has a phosphate on it. I can now remove that phosphate. That gives me energy to connect the fructose and the glucose together, and that will create sucrose. Remember, sucrose is a disaccharide, glucose and fructose. So all the energy I need came out of the G3P, and now I make sucrose. So this is the main product of um, photosynthesis for plants, but that's not the only thing they can make. The pool of golden G3P can be used to make amino acids, out of which I can, be, I can make proteins. It can be used to make fatty acids, out of which I can make uh, glycerol molecules, actually, which come out of this. And I can use that to make uh, triglycerides or phospholipids. And I can use, in fact, there's more, if you look in your book, this is a series of reactions that shows uh, basically how it's summarized. But here is showing you how it is you can make all the different things. We bring in uh, carbon dioxide to, the, to uh, the Calvin Benson cycle. There's the G3P. 3PG is another intermediate that we've made from uh, glycolysis. And we can use that to make all the lipids. We can use that to send in the Krebs cycle. We can use that to make all of the sugars. We can use that to make all the nucleotides and nucleic acids. We can do all, the, all of that from that G3P. Everything comes from that. So this is a very excellent place to end the class. Bio-181 ends with G3P, the most important molecule on the planet. You owe your life to it. So that is the end of the class, and I just want to say thank you very much for uh, sticking with it. It's been a difficult time for all of us. I understand that, uh, and I'm very proud of you all for sticking with it, doing as well as you've done, and I wish you all the best. If there's anything else that I can do for you ever, all you have to do is ask, and I'll do everything I can to help further your career.